of course, food is a very, you know, high value to all of us. And if we go to the stores, we see, you know, just a vast and, and wonderful diversity of foods that are coming from all over the world. At the same time, we're running farmers all over the world out of business. And yeah, so if you would speak to that, you know, it's just a concrete example of what we can do about addressing it before. Yeah. I think it's a great comment. Food is a very big driver for climate change and to avoid climate change. Yeah. So <laughs> this brings in globalization and global trade. And as consumers of food, we benefit to some extent you know, if our chocolate comes from Switzerland rather than uh, Pennsylvania, or no offense meant to it. But what I mean is the trading of things. The, this is the, uh, you know, if we can produce soybeans uh, to a lower cost than uh, another country, and if uh, Chile or whatever, and if they can produce uh, fruits and vegetables at a lower cost, we're both uh, better off. So, in principle, trade uh, has a logic. You want to restrict the environmental harm from growing crops. Uh, you, may want to, you may want to restrict uh, land use or the way uh, land is, is, is used. And, uh, of course, with trade, there's the issue of, of, work, of, of, of workers being affected, like steel workers. The answer is not to ban trade. The answer is to develop social programs that retrain workers and help them in, in ways that are meaningful to them. Very good. And the, um, let me say, and the second thing is, you have to regulate environmental quality and land use and everything else. And, um, the, you know, agriculture, is the, in, in this country, water pollution is regulated by the Clean Water Act that was passed in 1972. Agriculture is exempted and is exempted to this day. And most, the single largest source of water pollution in the United States is um, a non-point source from agriculture. All right, next question please, in the back. Okay, thank you. My name is uh, Carolyn. I'm a volunteer with the Sierra Club in Missouri. And I have another question related to egg. Um, I really appreciated your talk, or your emphasizing the local risks and um, extremes on a local level, because when we look kind of at the Missouri River Basin, we see that with uh, drought, floods, snow melt, all these issues. Uh, my question is, how can we help get big egg <laughs> sort of on in more involved in this? And I think you pointed out the issue of the Clean Water Act, you know, because that's a real hole that I think they don't want to see them um, pulled up and have any responsibility there. But how can we get them positively involved? Because this, in, this impacts what they do, you know, farming. The first assessment of climate change impact in the United States was a study done in 1975, and it included the Missouri Basin. I, th I think Peter Glick may have contributed, or he was, to, or at least was, you know, you were doing, Peter, you were doing your work right after that. That was identified in 1975, and the economic cost to uh, sort of Missouri agriculture, if I recall correctly, was estimated. There were no assessments until uh, whenever in the U.S. until whatever it was, uh, 10, 15 years ago. The existing assessments don't monetize uh, uh, the impacts. And so they describe them. But it, it, it's an unfortunate fact that if you don't sort of push these through, you, you can use a range, or, you know, whatever. Uh, but the current national assessment doesn't monetize the impacts. And... Um, you know, for economists, if something is not monetized, it literally is ignored. And that's why there's no communication between uh, uh, working group two and working group three. Uh, because all of, the, all of that stuff is not monetized, and to the, uh, the, the economists don't hear it, don't see it. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Okay, and I, I think I also want to address, say, agriculture, how it comes to agriculture in the Missouri River Basin. Um, but you mentioned that the costs need to be, um, you know, we need to look at the distribution of costs. But what I, my question is, what about the distribution of benefits, particularly when those benefits have been externalized 
into non-monetary. And so I think uh, if I look at levies here, um, someone will put up a levy because they benefit, but the costs are borne, at least on the Merrimack River, um, by some of our local levies by towns upstream. Um, and so if you could address that. You know, in a well-ordered society, very quickly, in 1900, scientists figured out how to uh, treat polluted water. Uh, and in those days, in 1900, there was complete sewerage in American cities. Every, in, in cities, all the sewerage was collected and was discharged untreated to rivers. And there was horrendous uh, death and, uh, you know, and morbidity and mortality from polluted water. And there was a big debate. Once they knew how to treat water, should they treat drinking water or should they treat wastewater when discharged? Mm -hmm. And the decision was made by the profession to treat drinking water. So... Uh, why? Because people didn't, if they were willing to pay to treat their drinking water, they didn't see what the hell they gained by uh, treating their sewage. A well-organized society finds ways, economic or, or regulatory or whatever, you know, to get, to bring about a situation where you have a right and fair distribution of costs uh, and, and benefits. And that requires political muscle at some point, because you're overriding someone's self-interest. We need to uh, finish up by 12.30, so we have time for one last question. Yes, uh, our second speaker in this session mentioned that several weaknesses are present in the messaging that we have heard, and you gave the example of the IPCC. I'm concerned uh, that there's sort of an elephant in the room in the sense that we talk about a two-degree C limit, and yet even at the current status, 1.2 degrees, we are already seeing tipping points that have been passed. Yes. And we are already seeing discussion of runaway global warming. I'm concerned that, that this messaging, this part of the messaging, has not been adequately presented. So uh, I don't, the Austrian did a national assessment, climate assessment, and it had an economic component. And they broke down, the, this was like five years ago, and they broke down the analysis into first the current effects of, of warming, and then secondly, the incremental effects. And I think I may be wrong that the national assessment so far in the US is just focused on the latter, which is the obvious bit. But th there are current effects, and as Catherine Mack mentioned, they're now being, being measured. Um, and so they, would be, they should logically be included in future national assessments and similar exercises. You want right. to? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, well, that concludes our session on uh, whole earth systems. Let us please thank our fabulous speakers again. Um, yeah.